Hold on. This is the day. Uh, here we are. Good morning. He is risen. He is risen. Oh, what a great day to be back with you, a reunion with uh, you good people at Emmanuel. And uh, what a great ride we had for two and a half years and so many friends developed over that time and, and meeting challenges with God's help. We navigated through the pandemic and we're still doing that. Grateful for your continuing to wear masks and social distancing. And uh, we called a pastor, Pastor Taylor. What a great event that was for the life of Emmanuel. So I'm grateful that she could get away after Easter. That's a, a good time for a full-time pastor to take a little break. And I assume that Luke must be with her as well. So North Carolina, there they go. During our absence from you, we had two babies born during the pandemic. Um, Samuel Ian was born in November to our daughter, Karn, who's out in uh, Gainesville, Florida. And, uh, of course, Jonna had her baby in February, Dax Oliver. So we are thrilled as a Sathry family uh, to announce that to you, and you already knew that. But uh, God has been good in spite of the pandemic. Many of you are vaccinated. I, Debbie and I have been vaccinated and uh, we're starting slowly but surely to get through this pandemic with God's help. So it's great to be with you today, and we celebrate Easter once again because the tomb is empty, and because he lives, we too shall live. Um, let us pray our opening prayer. Help us, almighty God, that our joyful celebration of the resurrection feast may be reflected in our daily work and conversation. Grant this, we pray, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please stand as you are able for the brief order for confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pause for a moment of silent reflection. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake God forgives us all our sins as I called and ordained minister of the church of Christ and by his authority I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. We'll sing our opening hymn. We will glorify.
Gracious God, through your Son's resurrected presence, you transform us from frightened, self-absorbed people into a community marked by peace, forgiveness, and mercy. Guide us to faithfully be signs to the world of your abundant grace and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We'll have the reading of the word at this time. reading is from Acts 4, verses 32 to 35. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens, and you water above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all ocean depths, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling his command. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful, for the people of Israel who are close to him. Praise the Lord. The second reading is from 1 John chapter 1 through um, chapter 2, verse 2. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testify to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Please stand as you are able for the Holy Gospel, according to St. John, the 19th chapter. To you, O Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. And so the, the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated for our children's sermon, and children remain in your seat as I share with you about, yeah, about this volleyball. Um, but you know it's a volleyball, and it comes from a story, and many of the big people have seen the movie Cast Away. It's a story about Chuck Nolan, who was on an airplane, and, and the airplane crashed. It crashed into the ocean. And fortunately, Chuck Nolan was washed ashore onto this tropical island in the Pacific. He's, his life was saved, but he was one, there was one problem. He was all alone. There's no other human being on that island. But he made up a relationship with, he found this volleyball washed up on shore, and with his bloody hand, he, he placed it on there and made a face, and he called it Wilson. Wilson, of course, is the volleyball, but uh, he had a friend finally. He needed affection. He needed a relationship with somebody, and that relationship was with Wilson. Then one day, a storm came, and washed Wilson out to the sea. And Chuck cried because he lost his friend forever. That was a terrible time for this poor man who was all by himself on this island. We know that we're never alone, children. We have Jesus as our friend, and he is so close. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. It's a beautiful thing that God always is with us and he gives us mommies and daddies to be extensions of his love jesus loves us so much he wants to be our friend forever let us pray lord we thank you that we have a friend in you that we're never alone that you always touch us with your love and you hear our cries and you pick us up when we're down Thank you, Lord, that we have a friend that's far greater than what Wilson was to Chuck Nolan and that you're with us to the end of the age. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us so much to be with us forever. Amen. <clears throat> I suppose we could have a volleyball game after this, but there, it needs to be blown up. It's kind of flat. <clears throat> On... January 28, 1986, 
the U.S. Space Shuttle Challenger blew apart after 73 seconds, and the whole crew was lost. Very tragic, and I think you remember that day when the Space Shuttle Challenger blew up. To console the nation, President Reagan quoted from a poem called High Flight, written by a World War II pilot, John Gillespie McGee. And in that poem, he talked about the untrespassed sanctity of space and that you could reach out your hand and touch the face of God. So no matter, uh, even though we can't literally touch God in the beautiful sunsets of the evening or meditating on nature, we can sense that God is near. One of the memories I have from the flying days is my first solo cross country from Williams Air Force Base, Chandler, Arizona, to Vandenberg Air Force Base here in California. And uh, uneventful as it was, I left and flew back to my base in Chandler, Arizona. It was after sunset, and now it was dark, and the stars started to appear in the sky. And there I was at 41,000 feet. And in one panoramic view, I can see the west coast. I could see the lights of San Francisco. I could see the lights of Los Angeles. I could see the lights of San Diego. And in the far distance... Phoenix, my destination. It's a memory I'll never forget. So I could relate to this poem where you feel like you can reach out and touch the face of God. As much as we can relate to this poem of high flight and the billowing clouds and feeling like you can reach out and touch the face of God, we know that God came down to us The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And God demonstrated his love by sending his only son to share in our joys and our sorrows, in our life and in our death and in our eternal life. This is what we call the incarnation or the enfleshment, God becoming human flesh. Jesus was both fully God and fully man. There's a cute story about a dad who is about ready to go to sleep in bed and he hears a little voice across the hall during a thunderstorm that says, Daddy, I'm scared. And the dad said, You're okay, honey. I'm just right across the hallway. Don't be afraid. And a few minutes later, the little voice said again, Daddy, I'm scared. Don't be afraid, honey. God is with you. Don't be afraid. You're okay. Then about three minutes later, Daddy, I, I don't care about God. I want someone in here with skin on. Someone with skin on. That's the God we know who knows our fears and concerns. He knows that we need someone to get us through the dark times in life. Something and someone tangible who understands. And so 2,000 years ago, God put on skin in the person of Jesus Christ. And by putting on skin, God showed the full extent of his love and his care for us. And because he became a human being, he can sympathize with us. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who was tempted in every way and yet without sin. And I have to admit that throughout the years, I've focused on the incarnation during Christmas, the babe Jesus, God becoming human flesh at Bethlehem. But now, as I study 1 John, our second lesson, I realize that this was a passion of him, of his, to communicate the incarnation at Easter. And as we look at that first John passage, he shows us how important that becoming human flesh, God becoming human flesh, really is. Because Jesus' cold, dead body was placed in that empty tomb. And yet Jesus physically walked out of that tomb that first Easter morning. It wasn't just a spiritual occurrence. It was a physical occurrence as well. And that's why we confess in the Apostles' Creed, 
I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Christ had to die to be our perfect sacrifice, to be the perfect substitution for us on the cross, forgiving us our sins. And being born human wasn't just for Christmas, but Easter as well, so that the total victory could be won over death. So what you see in this first John passage is a person, a pastor, who is combating heresy. The heretics' name were the Gnostics. They believed that the flesh was evil and the spirit was the good thing. Salvation could only be attained through higher knowledge. And these were spiritual snobs who looked down on people who didn't have that superior knowledge. They denied God himself in the flesh, and that there was a Christ and there was a Jesus on the cross. The Christ rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and Jesus, the flesh, died. They had a real heretical view, and only seemed, Jesus only seemed to have human flesh. So this is what John was combating in the early days of the church. Jesus, John was saying, was the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Jesus did physically die on the cross because of his love for us. And Jesus did physically and spiritually rise from the dead. And because he lives, we too shall live, both physically and spiritually. So we notice John's strong defense in this first chapter. As he says, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. That word is a capital W, and we know that word is Jesus. Heard, seen, touched, and John did it all as he walked with Jesus for three years. He saw Jesus healing a leper. He heard Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He saw the miracle of the fi feeding the 5,000, of changing water into wine. And he touched Jesus. You can imagine that Last Supper. In the Jewish tradition, they reclined at table. It meant they put their arms around their brother next to them, even feeding them. It was an intimate scene. So John more than once touched Jesus. He did it all for three years along with the other 11 disciples. He got up close to God. Now, some people want God at arm's length. Don't get near me. I'll call you. Don't call me. I'll let you know when I need you. I'll take you off the shelf when I need you, God. Debbie gets mad whenever I refer to <laughs> Bette Mittler's From a Distance. It's a song she sings, From a Distance. You remember that song. From a distance, we all have enough, and no one is in need. There are no guns, no bombs, and no disease, no hungry mouths to feed. From a distance, we are instruments marching in a common band, playing songs of hope, playing songs of peace. There are songs of every man. God is watching us. God is watching us. God is watching us from a distance. Some people think that God is up in heaven. He throws a couple of bones at us on the earth and watches us duke it out. No, God, we have a God who wants to get down and dirty with us, who loves us so much that he continues to give through the power of the Holy Spirit. God wants a relationship with us. He doesn't want to just stay in heaven and watch us duke it out until life's end. He's with us to the end of the age. So have you heard Jesus in your life? Have you seen him? Have you touched Jesus? Because all of this is good news to you and me as Easter people, because Jesus can be heard, you can see Jesus, and you can touch Jesus today. So first of all, have you heard Jesus in your life? The Old Testament command is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. We're to hear his word. And for us as Christians, Jesus is that word that gives life, convicts us of sin, and sets us free to be his people. And that's why in front of the heretics, the Gnostics, he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins 
and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Gnostics didn't believe sin was really of any importance. The important thing was the soul, the spirit, and superior knowledge. They didn't acknowledge the need to confess their sins. But John is saying, you need to hear that word. Faith comes through hearing. And in Romans 10, 17, we hear that faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of Christ. If you believe in Jesus, you have heard the word of God in your life. The Holy Spirit has been planted in your hearts and you responded in faith and trust in him. Some of you know that I was a pastor's kid. That comes with a, a bunch of uh, issues and problems. It can be a blessing, but I heard my dad preach Sunday after Sunday in my youth. I was embarrassed to sit with my mother in the pews and with my siblings, and so I sat in the balcony with my buddies, and I could hear their stories of their escapades on Saturday night and uh, watching Vern Gagne wrestling on TV. And I was so envious. They seemed to have so much more fun than me. And so uh, it was uh, a time when I, I kind of blocked myself off from what was going on in church. And yet, unbeknownst to me, the Holy Spirit was planting seeds in my life, even though I was resisting, in a sense, the message. I still remember some of my dad's illustrations in his sermons. This past Thursday, uh, Phil led a, a discussion on the prodigal son and uh, at our men's Bible study. And I can relate to living the life of the prodigal son, rejecting the faith of my youth and doing what was not good in God's eyes. And, uh, but it wasn't until I heard the word of God anew as a young adult in Alexandria, Virginia, I went to a Lutheran church with some relatives of mine and I heard a message that I heard many times before, but this time the Holy Spirit finally got through my thick skin and got to my heart when the pastor said, it's not what we do that saves us, it's what Christ did on the cross 2,000 years ago that saved us. And at that point, I felt a burden lift off of my shoulders, and I felt something I've never felt before, and a voice within me that says, you don't have to be macho, you don't have to prove yourself, all you have to do is serve Christ. I felt I was born again, and I was a different person. And uh, I realized the power of God's word in my life. For years, the gospel was suppressed in the former Soviet Union. The communists tried to stamp out any semblance of Christianity. And they were hoping that the old grandmothers could just fade away. They could sweep the floors, sell candles, and stick to their old traditions until they died out, they reasoned. But little did they know that the babushkas rocked the cradles of Russia. And many young people to this day would say that they learned about God for the first time through their grandmothers who sang hymns to them and told them stories until they drifted off to sleep. The power of God's word. So sing Jesus to your children. Sing about him. Tell the stories of Jesus. For future generations will be blessed. We often use a fancy word called the word is efficacious. Efficacious means it's powerful in and of itself, the word of God. No matter who is preaching, as long as it's the word of God, it has power in and of ourselves, itself. And that's why regular church attendance is so important. What you're doing here today, and this is supposedly low Sunday, the Sunday after Easter, but you decided to come anyway. You are being bathed in the word of God, whether you know it or not. The word of God to convict you of sin and to bring you life and eternity. So have you heard Jesus? But have you seen Jesus? Now this might be a bit more difficult because we don't physically see Jesus in our midst. Is it possible? And I say, yes. Maybe in a modified way, but we can see Jesus. And the great judgment scene in Matthew 25. The king is sorting out the sheep from the goats. I always feel sorry for the goats. You may have some goats at home. They're actually nice animals. But in biblical imagery, the goats are on the left and the sheep are on the right. 
And so the king is uh, basically saying to the sheep on the right, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you visited me. And the righteous were surprised that they were doing any good at all and in fact that they were doing it for the king. And the king replied, as the Passion Translation has it, Do you not know, when you cared for one of the least important of these little ones, my true brothers and sisters, you demonstrated love to me. You know about Mother Teresa. She ministered to the poorest of the poor in Calcutta, India. But this passage wasn't just a pious metaphor. It described reality. The secret of her infectious joy and boundless compassion was that in every person, every paralytic, every leper, every orphan, every invalid, she recognized Jesus. She could see Jesus in his many distressing disguises. Wow, have you seen Jesus my Lord, the song says. He's here in plain view. Take a look, open your eyes, he'll show it to you. We see Jesus in the eyes of the poor, in the eyes of innocent children, sick and elderly. If you visited the prisons, the shut-ins, given to the Fresno Rescue Mission and other means, you've seen Jesus. If, has you, have you sat with someone who's depressed, someone who's got an addiction they just can't kick? You look with them with compassion in your eyes. You've seen Jesus. And the evidence of Jesus' transforming power is around us. I think of the slave ship owner John Newton who wrote Amazing Grace. He said, I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Psalm 34, 8 says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So my prayer is that you will hear the words of that one song, Open My Eyes, Lord, I Want to See Jesus. That should be our heart's desire, to see Jesus. And you just might by seeing those who are less fortunate than us. So we've heard Jesus. We can see Jesus. Can we touch Jesus? There's a beautiful story in the Gospel of Mark about a woman with the issue of blood. And she had it for 12 years, a menstrual disorder. Now, for any woman who has had this type of condition, it would be terrible and epic. But for a Jewess, it means she would be ostracized, separated from her community. She could not worship in the temple, have relations with her husband, being out in public. And she had this for 12 years. But she heard that Jesus was in the midst, and she said, If only I could touch Jesus, I will be healed. And so she made her way through the crowd and eventually touched the hem of Jesus' garment. Jesus felt the power leaving him, and she was healed. Her healing began by touching Jesus. It's been so difficult during this pandemic not to have that hug or handshake on a Sunday like this. Because when we touch one another in the body of Christ, I feel like we get a piece of Jesus when we do that. And I've missed that human touch during this time of social distancing and sheltering in place. We've missed that human touch because it's so important to the human psyche. It releases endorphins, which creates well-being in our lives. We know that babies need that touch when they're born, being by their mother's breast and hearing her heartbeat, that babies who receive this kind of touch thrive better than those who do not have that gift. I wish I could hold the hands of my patients at the VA hospital, grasp that hand and let them know that God is near. And I hope we can return to that day, which is natural for human beings. Um, loving affection in an appropriate way. Touching Jesus. We do that pretty well as Lutherans. Pretty soon we're going to have Holy Communion, where we receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. It's a mystery. We, won't, we can't figure it all out. But we believe in the real presence of Christ in the meal. 
Luther said that in, with, and under the bread and the wine is the true body and blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. God comes to us in a very tangible way through the means of grace so that we can taste and see that the Lord is good. We take Jesus inside of us. We can smell and taste the bread and the wine. What a gift we have to hear, see, touch, and taste Jesus. No wonder in our gospel lesson that Thomas needed to see and to touch Jesus. He was not there when Jesus first appeared to the disciples. And he said, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Thomas gets a bad rap for doubting, but who could blame him? He needed evidence. He wasn't satisfied with secondhand knowledge. The Lord returned after eight days to those same disciples, but now Thomas was with them. And Jesus didn't criticize Thomas for his doubting. He had him touch his nail-scarred hands and side. And with the great confession, Thomas had his eyes open in faith. That great confession, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus said something amazing. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet who believe. He knows that we struggle in our faith. He knows that our faith gets cloudy and we doubt and we just get a glimpse of the big picture. And yet Jesus calls us blessed and he gives us the benefit of our doubt. But he challenges us to step out in faith and trust in him no matter what. Martin Luther King said, faith is taking that first step even when we don't see the whole staircase. Faith is taking that first step even when we don't see the whole staircase. It's about faith, my friends. And Easter declares Jesus is alive and real. The Jesus the Apostle John proclaimed was not a mythological creature or a ghost-like phantom. Phantom. He was God in flesh. He had known Jesus, walked with him, and he heard him teach. He heard him teach. And he had seen him miraculously heal people and even stood at the foot of the cross when Jesus died. And finally, Jesus appeared to John and the other disciple after his resurrection. But John was more than an eyewitness to Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. He was Jesus' close friend, carrying the nickname, the disciple whom Jesus loved. John is extending an invitation to you and me to enjoy the fellowship of the Father and the Son. John didn't just want to intellectually grasp that Jesus is God in the flesh. He wanted us to be in relationship with Jesus as he was. He wanted his readers to experience Jesus as a friend. Did you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus as a friend? He's someone that you can hear, and he can hear you. He's someone that you can see, and he can see you. He's someone that you can touch, and he touches you daily with his love and his healing power. He is real, my friends. He is believable. And he can be your friend if you receive him in humility. You'll have a friend for eternity. What a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We'll sing our hymn of the day. In Christ Alone, a great song.
please stand as you are able for the confession of the Apostles' Creed. Let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And I'll say... Let us pray. <clears throat> Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I know you've been praying for those needing healing. And we're going to include that in our prayers of the church. Let us pray. Lord, we're so grateful that you are real, that you are God in human flesh, that you rose not only spiritually but physically. And because you have won the complete victory, we have that same complete victory, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. We do pray for healing for Stanley Stamp, uh, who's going to have surgery tomorrow. We pray for Llewellyn Ostergaard, who lost her sister and not long ago lost her brother. So comfort her in her hour of need. We pray for Pastor Gary Gould, who's had a long-standing battle with so many things. Encourage him in the days to come that you are there to lay your healing hand upon him. Be with Jimmy, Victoria's cousin. We pray for uh, Don... Uh, Pettit and Christy, who are going through health issues as well. We ask that you be with Pastor Taylor and Luke on this well-deserved time away. Refresh them while they're in North Carolina and bring them back safely to pastor us and be in our midst. We pray for Emmanuel Lutheran Church as we navigate through this pandemic, as more and more of us receive our vaccinations and as we start turning the corner, we look forward to that day when we can gather together and give hugs and handshakes, if that's possible, and be indoors. Thank you, Lord, for the work of the doctors and nurses who are putting their lives on the line for our sake. Uh, give them rest and recovery uh, from this pandemic. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We prepare for Holy Communion, and hopefully you have the little cups handy. Uh, yeah, I see a green light. All right, thanks. the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and gave thanks, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had supped, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood, given and shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now everyone should have uh, that small communion package and raise your hand if you haven't received one. We'll make sure you get one of those uh, kits and the ushers will deliver. We'll eat the body first, the bread, the body of Christ given for you, take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Thank the Lord and his praise. Everyone what he has done. Let everyone who seeks the Lord rejoice and proudly bear his name. He recalls his praise. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of those whom you have fed with one heavenly food, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Because he lives, there, I, w I almost brought a write-up on that by Gloria Gaither, who was having a difficult time in her life. She was expecting a baby, and her husband, uh, Bill, was receiving extra criticism because he was sick and uh, not doing well with the music industry. And so on why the fireplace she contemplated is life worth living these days and to bring a baby into such a world. And it was then that the Lord spoke to her and just because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Just because he lives, all fear is gone. And she said, how, how beautiful to hold a newborn baby. We can do that because Jesus lives. Let's sing that song.
What a wonderful time we've had in this beautiful California day. And now I'll go with this benediction. As you go, may God go with you. May he go before you to show you the way. May he go behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you and within you to grant you his eternal peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. God bless you all.